This is a variation of a program I've done a number of times um, that has included ICC evaluation reports. This time, that's all we're going to focus on. And we are going to, um, and this slide will be at the end too. So if you want the uh, website or, or my email address, you can copy at the end. So uh, let's just get started. For some of us, you know, when we start thinking about railroads and and having fun and maybe doing a little research, uh, we're kind of more like these guys. Uh, now, I do want you to take note that that's a really nice M and St. L um, engine there that is being. And others of us get started with things like this rail fan trips. We heard a story about a steam engine coming through or a big boy or something, and we all flock out to get some pictures. So this is Guilford, Iowa, Gifford, Iowa, in 1956. Hey, uh, oh, yes. Did you get a picture of me? I was on that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> is is that why that was so funny, Fuzzy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Totally out of focus. Yep. It is doesn't look like a tin type or a daguerreotype. I was going to say, is this is this Ron right down here? The white hair? I think, yeah, a boy <laughs> back then. Boy, Matthew Brady did great work, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. so, well, anyway, my, my journey in, in doing this type of stuff began with, I was interested in stock pens. And outside of the Campbell models, there was very, very little information available at the time as I was interested in. Um, this is a picture of my wife looking through the fence at Chama at the Denver Rio Grand stock pens. This is back in 1985. It was first stock pens that I ever saw somewhat intact. Was pretty excited about that. And that in turn is what led me into what I call a railroad archaeology. You know, vintage photos. We've talked about that before. Google images, Bing, Sanborn, fire insurance maps. I think some of you are familiar with those, but the ICC evaluation reports are something that Bill Schomburg with Railroad Model Craftsman told me about. So, and as you can see, I've, I've done a few articles with RMC and um, noted HO scale modeler. Some organization gave me a number 676, proves I'm authentic, right? Amen. Yeah. So, and of course, you know, we've, I've shared photos with you before and some really interesting photos, of course. It's, um, how'd you like to be the second driver in that, complete <laughs> with a, a chain tying you to the first truck, just in case. <laughs> you better keep oh. up. Yep. Yeah. And then here's here's a nice little modeling project showing a meatpacking plant and a bakery and a barge operation. That would make a neat model, wouldn't it? And that's the type of stuff I look for when I'm looking for information. Of course, some of us like the details, you know, how do you load tires or unload tires out of a box car, especially when it's placard for plumbing fixtures. Um, I, I, you know, there's been times that I think I sat on a tire like that for a purpose, but no, we, let's move on. <laughs> of course, you know, maps, I've always collected maps. And that's one of the things that you'll find in the ICC re reports are maps you'll find some photographs but uh mostly it's drawings um yeah sandboard maps we talked about those features of them but the icc valuation reports this goes back to 1913 when the congress passed what was called the valuation act the idea was to learn how much the railroads had invested in their physical plants and all the assets they they owned inventoried oh gosh they, they even counted the brooms and the depot in this process uh, and the purpose was to figure out the value of each railroad based on their assets so that in turn, the government could calculate passenger and freight rates so that they would be somewhat equal across the nation. And so no one company or no one passenger was getting gouged by railroad A because they thought they were worth more than railroad B. So uh, the interesting things about ratio reports and also included a lot of information about the histories of the, of the corporate uh, organization, the details of their construction of property, their financing operating results, and it was, you know, kept up to date. They had to file reports with the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, 
um, until it was done away with. So, and these re this valuation report, the act was passed in 1913. They began going out into the field in 1914. And so they sent teams out doing engineering field notes to survey the physical property of railroads from 1914 to 1929. And they, this included roadway notes. And so they, the roadways were big blueprint sized sheets of paper for each mile of roadbed, um, noting everything from culverts to type of ballast, to how many ties. Uh, I mean, they counted literally everything. So these reports are just invaluable if you're interested in modeling a particular railroad, a particular area, or a particular structure or detail of the railroad. Um, some of the drawings that were done were quite good. The people sent in the field included architects and draftsmen. This, a few of them were it went with cameras, so there were a few photographs. Again, you're talking 1914, you know, basically just prior to World War I, so the photography was somewhat limited. But it's still, it's amazing what, and I'll get to some more of that here in a minute. Um, but the value, and then they created these valuation maps that contained a lot of engineering details, lay out a track location of railroad owned buildings, which the Sanborn maps are not near as good of that because if most railroads were self insured. Sanborn was interested in buildings and companies that they wanted that somebody needed fire insurance for. So, um, Railroads were kind of a, well, they might be sketched in, but oftentimes they were just a sketch, whereas these valuation reports are very detailed maps. And they're all available through the National Archives at College Park, Maryland, on the campus of the University of Maryland. Um, they've got over 11,000 cubic feet of um, stuff stored there, and it's known as Record Group 134. So... If you find yourself going to Washington, D.C. area and want to visit the National Archives, it's recommended that you contact them in advance to make an arrangement um, because they want to uh, meet each person who wants to access these records and find out the purpose of why they want to do it, et cetera. Um, but it's, a, it's well worth doing. I've been out there several times now, and it's just um, my wife and I both have just been fascinated by what we found. But anyway, here's a actual copy of the booklet, the date of 1916, um, that by the act of, you know, the, the commission is required to value the property of all common carriers subject to the act to regulate commerce. Now you will find that some private railroads were never um, inventoried or mapped, but they got right down into the logging and mining railroads to some extent. So, and the instructions tend to describe the field work that was done and building a branch of the engineer, blah, blah, blah. The build of the party that was sent out typically included one field architect, one junior architect, and one tapeman. And you know what the tapeman did? He held the other end of the measuring tape. You know, he was the grunt. But, um, and uh, some of these guys were really good. Others were terrible handwriting, as I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, one of the outcomes, uh, several of the railroads published uh, a summary of the ICC valuation report. I happen to have a copy of the one for the Minneapolis to St. Louis that was completed in 1928. So I'll be sharing a few things with you out of this book. And this is like 300 pages. That's a 11 by 17 book of over 300 pages um, of information. The valuation maps, this is a Minneapolis and St. Louis valuation map. It, it shows all the, all the lines. And, you, and all the towns, and you'll notice these little dotted lines have got a little circle that says, like this one says SD2A. That means South Dakota section, um, valuation section 2A. And then you'll notice that there's a, here's a 1B and a 1A. And you'll notice each state is divided up separately. And so when you go and ask for valuation records, the first thing you'll do is ask you which section do you want? And if you don't know, then they're they wind up pulling all kinds of things out, but um, you know I've for the and saying oh I've got this map I've got it scanned and will share it happily with anybody. So here is the table of contents out of that summary book that I showed you, and this is the table of contents mostly for Iowa, which is my main focus, and it also includes the pages for Illinois. But here are all the categories that are included in the summary. 
Um, you notice there are some numbers missing. The ones that I like to focus on, station and office buildings, water stations, fuel stations, such as coaling, coaling towers and coal chutes and stuff, shops and engine houses. These are just, for a modeler, the information contained here is just valuable to no end. And of course, also bridges, trestles, et cetera. So, and then this will tell you which section do you want? Well, if you want 3A and you want office buildings, you go down here to um, page 164 in the, in the book. And I have got this whole thing now scanned so I can do this all on my computer. But here, I'll give you an example. This is the depot at Eldora, Iowa. This is the description of the summary for Eldora. And what they've tells you the stock pens, notice that they've been penciled out. So those may be already kaput or gone at the time that the summary was completed. But it gives you the passenger and freight depot. It tells you it's a one story building, it's frame construction, it is wood. It's got a prepared roof. So that's got an asphalt or tar paper roof. The building itself is 20 foot by 60 foot. The platform is 12 by, I think that says 10. Um, various sundry items in there. Brick pavement, concrete curb, which we can see in the photo. Got water and sewer lines and includes furniture. And what they've done, this is the percentage of the valuation and then the putting some dollar figures on there, which is the numbers they were, the number crunchers were after. But for us as modelers, it's this list here that, oh, gosh, now I know what size building it was. If I can find a photo, which I happen to find, I got to be a long ways to scratch building or kit bashing this building based on some of this information. Now here is, this is the um, page, one page out of the field notes. Uh, what I showed you was from the summary book. This is now out of the actual field notes. This is again, the Eldor Depot. Look at the sketch, the guy, the team that was out in the field, they made this actual sketch. Um, they, you know, you get, you know, concrete curbing, the platform information, uh, they'll tell you, they might even count it all the bricks. Here's the, the dimensions for the coal shed that was a part of the depot. Um, it, you know, this sketch would give you, here's, we all got the offset bay, the, the toilet over here on this side. Um, again, the size and dimensions. It gives you the date when this was done, which was the 19th of November in 1918. And here you've got the signature of the ICC, the ICC representative, as well as the railroads representative. And this is all under account number 16, which is buildings and structures. And notice this is just on a, done on a basic graph paper. Others forms had different, um, different forms for different information, but gives you an idea of the type of information you can find in these reports. Now here also, this is for Eldora. My interest, like I said, was the stock pens. Well, notice here on the right side, we've got a special page for stock pens, a place to sketch out the stock pens, a place to how many pens were there, the loading chute, the dimensions in the loading chute, the number of gates, what size were the gates, how tall, how many rails there were, what were they, were they, those were two by six and they were oak, um, information about the posts, how far apart on center were the posts for holding the, the fence boards, uh, and then other information like, does, is there a set of scales there? This one had Fairbank scales. What size were the scales? Uh, what size was the weighing pen? Uh, you know, those water comes from a city water supply. So you just had a hydrant or fixture there. Uh, that, and again, the dimensions here, you can see the there's the platform and the loading chute. You got the alleyways. There's the dotted dash lines here show you where there are sheds to protect the hogs. So each of these pens have got partially covered with a roof. Um, you could go about building a very credible scratch built model with just this page and have, have a, a contest winning model, no doubt. And then this is the mile report for mile 374, which this is where the depot sat. And there is the coal bunkers back there and, and the street crossings. All, all in this mile, and it gives you all this type of information. I realize you can't read this closely because this is squeezed down to fit on my on a screen or page, but I'm just sharing with you the type of information you can find. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Grinnell Depot, a unique turreted 
Joint Depot at the Rock Island and Minneapolis and St. Louis and the diamonds here in front. Um, this was the early Rock Island Depot before that nice brick building was built. But here is what the ICC report says about that brick depot and also the stock. Business. This is Minneapolis and St. Louis side. Passenger Depot, jointly owned, one-story brick, 47 by 47, circular tower and train shed, stone foundation, plumbing, hot water heat, electric light, you know, just tons of information there. Um, and then the freight depot, which sat off to the side, had, uh, again, information, brick platform and curbing. So then uh, we get into the drawings. And because I was looking for stock pens, I was dealing with both railroads. This was the drawing for the Minneapolis and St. Louis report. And you notice there's a nice sketch here of the floor plan and the platform and stuff and the um, passenger. But this is out of the Rock Island side. They had a different guy at Rock Island than the M and St. L. You can tell by the signatures. You can also tell his printing was a little bit neater. And his focus on the sketch and drawing was, he was focusing more on the main waiting room and also Notice how he's showing the M and St. L on one side in this turret in the Rock Island. This was the office, and they had desks that faced each other, M and St. L on one side, Rock Island on the other side. And this was not a two-story depot. The windows you see were just extra clear story lights. But this is where they could, the M and St. L came on, on this side, and Rock Island came on this side. So they could watch their respective railroads. You had the waiting room out here with a little bit of a cafeteria. Uh, that gives you some wonderful information and he's done a nice outline drawing so um and then the rock island guy also he gives you the foundation drawing shows you there's a stairway down there and they had a furnace uh, and a chimney down in the basement with some, I've, some yes i've eaten at that restaurant yes i've unfortunately that restaurant's closed down now but for a while that rare that depot had been had a functioning restaurant in it it's, and the building's still there, just a fabulous building. So, um, and it, you know, you can see here it's jointly owned 50% each railroad. Uh, continue on the Rock Island guy, he just did extensive detail. Here are the, the, the roof rafters, which are now visible inside the building. But what caught my wife's eye, she was doing the Rock Island stuff, photocopying it. He did sketches of light fixtures with the dimensions, brass finish, alba glass 14 inches high one foot six inches high for this main one where do you find that type of detail <laughs> it just and that's what you can find in these evaluation reports now of course in grinnell this was the grinnell freight house um, which this is highway 14 believe it or not so this is a fairly old photo and look at the crossing gate up there on top of the roof of the freight house this was west of the depot a couple of blocks. This in turn is the Minneapolis and St. Louis freight house. Really looks like a depot because it's got a bay window. And my, my speculation, this was their depot before they did the joint depot with the Rock Island. And this sat, sat a couple blocks south of the brick depot there in Grinnell. Um, but here are, here's the Minneapolis and St. Louis reports on that freight house. Again, we got a drawing a sketch shows the bay window down here, various other information about what size was the chimney, what, what color was painted. Here's an outline of the, of the platform on a second page with information about the size of the bricks and things of, of that nature. Um, so yeah, as a modeler, it's just fascinating stuff. Uh, let's see what else we can find ICC reports. This is, this is um, Chicago Northwestern. This is the engine house in Ames, Iowa, built in 1882. And notice we here we've got the sketch of the floor plan showing the pits. And then we've also got, here's a nice sketch of the wall showing all the framing and then where the window and door were located. Um, plus all the detail information, this, the size of every, they counted every board and timber and rod and and then down here in the corner we got a couple probably water closets yep two toilets water closets got probably got a, a stove right there in between the two bays uh, i think that's a boiler. Gra gravel roof yes question i think that's a boiler well it could be a boiler that looks like a 
Looks like it says boiler under the under the 48 inches. You know, it could be Brian, and it could be something that they use to keep the engines warm, you know, or something. I don't know. But yeah, the amount of detail that are included, and these pages are your standard eight and a half by eleven type pages. Um, so you know, there's a, and they're all done in pencil. So getting good photocopies was sometimes a challenge if they were very light with their pencil work, but it's still just some of the fascinating detail. Here is the I don't, elevator. I don't think I don't think I've ever seen curved rails inside a uh, a roundhouse before. <laughs> oh, the yeah, I see that right there. The bottom stall. Yes, look at that. Yep. That's yeah. Like I said, the detail in these things. That, now here's the crossing gate um, at Kellogg Street and Duff Avenue in Ames. Nice Chicago Northwestern elevated gate on on two posts with the stairway going up. But it, it gives you the design on on the wood exterior. Information about the size of the chimney, um, stair information, etc. And then over here we have got the water tank that was at Carroll, Iowa. This is Chicago Northwestern again. Um, <laughs> different, I can see it's two different people doing these because the signatures are different, but the detail, here's the footprint for all the footings for the water tank. Now this would probably be a standard Chicago Northwestern water tank. So you could take this drawing, build you a Northwestern water tank and put it almost anywhere and no one's gonna dispute you unless they come up with a specific photo. The same with the crossing gate. So now, Ron, you're a member of the Historical Society. You tell me if I'm wrong, but these are pretty generic Northwestern structures, are they not? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, and it's just fascinating I, you know, when we found stuff. Now here, this is Carol. This was the coal chute. Before they started using coaling towers, they were putting, you know, you had a long ramp going up on a trestle to the top where you had a covered um, coal bins for coal chutes, and then you had chutes on each side to um, coal the locomotives. So here's the details for all that construction with the footings and you know counting every you know every board, the dimensions of the boards, etc. So, and of course here's the depot at Carroll, Iowa, on the northwestern. Um, the interior here's here's the sketch for the sign, the electric sign that says cafe. Here's the drinking fountain. Here are the passenger department counter um, information for you about your ticket. <laughs> this, I don't think I have a sketch of the depot, but these were details that, uh, again, I, I think my wife, she, she just, her eye caught things like this. And so we made, I said, go to copy or make the copy. Uh, just, it was fascinating. So, yeah, it says, uh, so, silver center, silver tray at lunch counter or shelf, you know, just where else are you going to find this kind of detail if you want to do, say you want to build this depot and you want to do the interior. There you've got the plans ready made, ready to go. And of course, here's the platform shelter. Um, this is probably pretty much, pretty much a standard Chicago Northwestern style design, but it gives you the dimensions, tells you what size the post is and, and the paint specs and all that type of um, Carol, this is the ice house at Carol. Here are the stock pens at Carol. And we can see the scale down here at one end, um, the loading chutes, uh, you know, just again, the detail. And I, I'm going to run through this. Here's for Ron, here's the interlocking tower at Tama. That's yeah, I have that. <laughs> yeah, I think I've sent this one to you. But yeah, uh, I think I've, I've been out to the archives. And I too uh, picked up these things. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just uh, the amount of detail is just fascinating. Now, here's something you don't often think about within these. This is West Liberty, Iowa on the Rock Island. Here is a, a general sketch of the depot and the depot platforms, because this was a crossing of the BCRN in Rock Island. But then here's a whole track diagram showing you the yard where the turntable roundhouse was the depot uh, the why go you know the why that was involved there uh, just again it's and uh, notice that the lettering and the printing is completely different 
I see this Ari Kinsler or whatever on Rock Island stuff a lot of time and his unique <coughs> printing writing style, but whoever did this one's completely different draftsman. Um, so let's, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I got in the stock show. Okay, this is Hampton. Hampton never had any stock pens per se on the M and St. L, but they did have a stock shoot for loading stock and uh, livestock. And this is some information on that. I'm, I just built the model of, of Hampton, Iowa and the Sheffield, Iowa. So I threw these two in. Here's the stock pens at Sheffield. Here we can see the alleyway and the platform with, with the loading chute. Um, probably the scale house up here. So it's swinging unloading chute somewhere in some basic dimensions of Fairbanks scale. So I've got the information I need to build, build this model in a credible fashion. So speak up if you got any questions. Hey, Doug, not mm. a question, but when you were showing the tower at Tama, it's interesting to note that they, uh, Milwaukee owned part of that tower. And yes. it, says, it says on that drawing what the percentage was. And when yeah. the Milwaukee had their wreck out there, why uh, they didn't have enough money to replace the tower. And that was at the point where the Milwaukee abandoned the track from Tama clear down to Cedar Abbots and went on the <laughs> North Western. Yeah, so. And, Doug, yes. Doug, the engine house that had the curved track in it. Yes. Was that served by a turntable? Oh, let's see if we can uh, back up here. Like Brian, I find that very interesting. And why would you do that if you had a turntable out there? But if you if you built it, you built it as a roundhouse and then didn't have a turntable, that's probably what you'd have to do to get in the thing. Okay, yeah, this is at Ames. I am not aware of a turntable there. Okay. Do you know, Ron? No, I don't think so either. Yeah. Because I mean, it was, it's too it was short. The two stall. It looks the way these are lined up, you could almost be coming off a of one turnout into those two tracks. And uh, you know what? It's that's hard to believe like you could even get a, how you're going to get a locomotive around that that tight curve. I mean, it's got to be a small locomotive. Or a larger door, but it doesn't look like a larger door. Of course, this this is 1920. This building was built in 1882. In 1882, they pretty much were 440s and 260s. <laughs> so, well, maybe they maybe they built it that way, hoping they were going to have a turntable, and it just never happened. Let's see. That's sheet number what? It's sheet one of two. I wonder, do you have number two? Well, that's that's sheet, the other side. Sheet two and sheet nine. That's all I've got. A lot of the the other sheets would have just been field notes giving all the dimensions of all the pieces of timber and such. Yeah, so, they they might have given you some information as why that track looks curved there. Yep, they they very well could have. If you look at the drawing itself, yeah. the lines don't converge at the point of the front wall. It goes back about twelve feet. It looks like mm -hmm. then then the triangle starts. Yeah. Because this so this one sure. this wall here doesn't continue all the way out here. It hits there in angles. I'm, so I'm thinking that's an addition to a building that was already there. You know, it could that's have been it. a sing, could have been single stall and a second stall added on at some later date. Yeah. Well, well the other isn't the, also. isn't the other possibility that it got extended ah. where the where the track ends rather than the curve going out that that was the end of the the round or you know these buildings and then got an extension put on later for a larger locomotives well let's see this this note right in here says an addition built about 1919 yep. see? right and over here That's it why. says something about built 1918 the water closets <laughs> <laughs> well, the, so, the, at the very top, it says the engine house was built in 1882. That's right. So it may have been a single stall, and then they added a second yep. stall, or they extended them. This might have been a much shorter engine house. There it's, should be an there should be an AFE that explains all of that somewhere. There should be. Yep. yep. <laughs> uh huh. 
but but no this is only seven, 76 feet long so this is not a large structure for an engine so well questions to be asked in the future let's move on here otherwise i'll run out of greg's time <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things is um, each section of the valuation report was was in its own folder. And as I got into different sections of the Minneapolis St. Louis, I found different types of forms. Like this is for the section up, this is Storm Lake um, shops and engine houses, turntables and cinder pits. And all of a sudden I got this really nice form, all this information typed in here. Uh, this stuff is dimensions of the pit materials of construction the turntable information uh, cinder pits hoisting apparatus uh, concrete uh, elevation of earth timber and you know the detailed information this is just like somebody's gives you a form and you fill in the the parts you can about the particular location so we've got esterville Spencer and Storm Lake, and we've got the different information about what each of those locations had for, and they were all a hand turned turntable, 60 foot, 70 foot, 65 foot. Um, so it just, you know, just it floored me when I came across this particular form. I had not run into that before with all the other railroads. Here's a, another, you can see this is titled Minneapolis and St. Louis Valuation Division. This is station and office buildings, furniture and fixtures. Look at that, they wanna know how many, um, this says cupboards and cupboards, uh, cuspidors, desks, filing cabinets, fire extinguishers, lamps, oil cases, um, clocks, chairs, bulletin boards barrels they literally counted everything um here we got warehouse scales down here uh stoves ticket cases truck yeah trucks hand trucks i'm assuming and i'm not can't can't quite make out that word but it just this you know, look at that one water pail one water pail one um just uh, the and every depot had a slightly different inventory for that type of stuff but they were counting everything and as this as this process grew, they developed better and better forms for doing the counting, because this was done in 1917. Um, here's another one. This is station and office buildings. This is the dimensions of the station buildings, uh, the class of structure. Okay, we got a toilet building. We got a walkway. We here we got a depot walkway, depot toilet walkway, uh, and in the different in the it's a frame, it's timber, it's brick, it's got shingles on it. It's uh, so just, and then we get into here is Stilson, Iowa. Here we got a sketch of the depot with a, a little bit of a floor plan showing us where windows and doors are located. Um, double water closet located somewhere. And of course, this is account 19. This is the, um, this is one of those bucket coaling platforms that Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Road in Wisconsin was known for. Minneapolis and St. Louis also used them. So here's the basic outline and you can see the, the design of the crane. Um, is just, yeah, just fascinating Doug, stuff. Doug, can you back up uh, one uh, image? I can try. Because yes. there's a difference in the forms this form is the actual railroads valuation division. If you look yep. at the top, yep. If you if you go to the next form that we were just looking at, it's the ICC's. Form. Yes, but what happened was I know particularly the Minneapolis and St. Louis sent stuff to the ICC in preparation for the valuation report, including sketches and drawings of depots, and so they probably filled out these forms and sent them in advance so they wouldn't have to spend as much time in the field with the ICC people. Um, but you're right, I, I hadn't made that connection, but thank you, Dave, that's, that's very helpful. So, but again, it's all part of the ICC records now because this was something the railroad sent in in preparation, so. 
again, I'm just sharing with you some of the tidbits that I found. Now, here is the depot at Hedrick, Iowa. This is a joint m and l in Milwaukee. Um, and here is the ICC, the m and l's report on the depot at Hedrick. You can see we've got a nice sketch with the outline. Again, all the particular information um, that it's a, a joint depot with the Milwaukee as well as M&St.L. Um, so, and, uh, you know, information about the coal shed and all that stuff. Here I is, believe that okay, Hendricks Depot is still there. Yes, it is. It's been relocated up on the highway. It's now used by a real estate auctioneer person as an office, but the building still stands. Yeah, so. I, I, it, that's an interesting, uh, what's left there is still interesting with the old elevator and stuff. Yep, yep, so here is, uh, you know, like I said, my interest stock pens. This is Storm Lake, Iowa, but this particular field agent, he was shading in the sheds for the hogs. You know how sometimes people like to doodle and he's got, there's the scale and here's the platform and the loading chute. But again, all the information. Um, this was some interesting, this is back in the Rock Island records. I was doing most of the railroads in Iowa when I was out there, but this is on fence standards. And here we've got a, a sketch showing us the fence boards and fence posts. I'm assuming this is for fencing along the right of way to protect the right of way. And then here we have got a cattle guard uh again that you know where the where the trial the fence would go across the tracks and so we've got a cattle guard and how the, and the details related to that um and here's some here's some, some more information on the cattle guard with the type of material that was used to at the tracks itself and then here we've got the um farmer gate the standards for the farmer's gate to have access to Did I hear someone comment? Uh, oh, my granddaughter just came in the room with a, a little boat that she made for me. I told her I enjoyed it. Well, yeah, you need to focus on her for a moment. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, she's, my, this she's, one of, she's one of my two treasures. Yeah, this is something I found interesting in the Rock Islands records. This is a Davenport. This is showing the location of retaining wall construction on property of the Rock Island by, uh, uh, this is, I think, along the river edge where the Mississippi River comes down past Davenport. So we've got, um, you know, all this construction. I, that's not something that we often don't think about for railroads. Uh, this hey, one, I, I got a comment on that. Are, yes. I think that is, that is in, uh, it's about two blocks off of the river. And that was a, I think I might have some pictures of that thing. That is extremely interesting uh, brick and concrete uh, uh, building. When you look at the, uh, what's the retaining wall construction of property of the uh, brick company. Mm-hmm. No, it says constructed on property of the Rock Island by the WG Block and Company. Yeah. And the coal shed the lease of concrete wall there so yeah it'd be if you've got more information it'd be interesting i just thought it was an anomaly among all the other drawings that i'd come i'll across. have to see if i can find it i'll send it to you yeah yeah that'd be great so whereas over on this side here we've got this is again rock island this is a brooklyn iowa this is a powerhouse and machine shop um we've got the basic you know Concrete, you know, we've got the outline of the foundation and then the, the roof elevations here. Uh, rub, rubble and limestone, it looks like it says. Uh, more on Brooklyn. Here is the engine house at Brooklyn. You can see it was three stalls and it had three more longer ones added on at a later time. And then here's the framing. Uh, I, again, and this shows you know, the construction of the pit and the type of roof. So. You could take this information and be a long ways towards building a model of something like this. So here is also Brooklyn. This is the details on the turntable pit. Uh, you can see and it's got the dimensions, et cetera. Whereas over here, this is West Liberty. This is the roundhouse at West Liberty 
You can see the roof line and again, the framing outline here. This one is Stewart, Iowa. The engine house is Stewart, Iowa. Whereas this one is Council Bluffs, Iowa. Much bigger facility for a much larger operation than Council Bluffs. Again, this is all Rock Island. And uh, let's see, this is, oh, this is framing, I think, at Council Bluffs. Uh, more framing type of information, just. This is um, Valley Junction, that is what, what we know as West Des Moines. That was a very full roundhouse they had there. So, and again, sketch of, of the support structure. Um, the pits, the various pits. And there we, well, okay, we got electric lighting, Des Moines, Iowa, the Rock Island Depot in Des Moines. This was their light fixtures. And again, more of the different light fixtures that were in the depot there. So. This is Neola, Iowa. This is just northeast of Council Bluffs on the rock. This was a grain elevator that the railroad owned. Uh, outline of the grain, grain elevator. What caught, caught my attention was in 1916, it was covered with corrugated iron which I, and I don't affiliate or I don't associate corrugated iron with the date of 1916. Uh, so, so that one, plus the fact that this was a railroad owned grain elevator, not a privately owned grain elevator. But again, it's, you know, here's the, the footprint, the different bins and the construction. So details. Oh, uh, there's that Brooklyn. I got, I got some repeats in here. Sorry about that. This was the Ellis Patton bumping post. If you wanted to build one of those, again, Rock Island. And uh, let's see, what do we got here? This is the coal chute at Kellogg, Iowa. Remember how I talked about the trestle and the ramp going up? Here's a, an outline of the bin up at top. Somebody would be up here shoveling out of those guns into these bins so that you could coal up your locomotives. This is the um, engine house at... Uh, West Liberty again, and that is it. A quick journey into what ICC valuation reports are all about. Doug, question. Yes. You know, when you look, since you're stock pens, how about Esterville with the big, all the packing houses that were there? Did they, I didn't say, I'm surprised you didn't, did you find any stock pens in Esterville? I got, 2, I got over 2,000 pages of these, Lester. I couldn't share them all. <laughs> no, no, but you do have then. Esterville, right? I'm sure I do. I've also okay. got the railroad maps for the Rock Island and the MSNO at Esterville. So, yeah, okay. I'm all equipped. <laughs> Very nice. But if the stock pens were owned by a private company and not the railroad, then you wouldn't, they wouldn't be included. That's true. Most of the stock pens were built and owned by the railroad. A lot of them got sold later on to private concerns like the Sale Barn or Cattlemen's Association or something. But uh, early, you know, again, these reports are from World War or World War One vintage, and the railroads, you know, had built and and owned them at that point yet. But there are some of the historical societies have gone in and made copies of their particular railroad reports. Some of them have been copies have been farmed out to other locations, but for most of this stuff, it's at only available at um, College Park, Maryland, and they do not have a complete set because they got whatever the railroads gave them. When the, when the railroads were starting to dump, dump these reports in the 40s, they got transferred to the National Archives. And then in the 60s or 70s, there was a movement, hey, nobody's ever looked at this stuff. Why are we keeping it? Let's start, we should toss it. And one fellow said, no, there's some valuable information in there. We should keep it. His name was David Pfeiffer. And he was the archivist that I worked with the first time I was there that Bill Schomburg had told me about. He's long since retired, but he trained some other people in what's there now. And they have a good record of what's, you can contact them. I, I know the Chicago Northwestern Society for a while had a member who lived in the D.C. area who would go in on Saturdays 
and make copies for people if when requested. I don't know if they're still offering that service or not. I think that's long been so. done. Away. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. They the uh society does have quite a few of the uh copies of the uh uh AFE of the uh evaluations. Right. Um certainly the maps and and, and some of the other significant reports and and so, you know, if you get a particular railroad you follow, you might want to double check with their historical society and they may have copies of these reports or they may know of a local because the National Archives has got satellite spots around the country, Denver, Denver, Colorado being one where there are some copies of this stuff stashed away. But I just I can't tell you what or where you would have to call College Park and talk to somebody. To see if there's something closer to where you live. So. Yeah, I haven't had the luxury of going out to Washington D.C. to look this stuff up, but Gene Green was uh, kind enough to send me what he had when I was trying to scratch build things for Winthrop, and I think I ended up building out of just basically from the ICC reports in 1917, uh, the depot, the uh, uh, um, engine oh, house, uh, four, four stall engine house, yep. uh, stockyards. Um, and in a bunch of other ancillary facilities, and it, and it was it's interesting, but unfortunately, I think I think the guys with the worst handwriting in the world got assigned to that line. It's, it's, it's you look at it, and you just you get a headache trying to decipher what it is. Yeah, I could tell which ones were done by draftsmen and which ones were done by the tape guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing here. So. We can, but Very nice. yeah, that, that's something I just kind of pulled together. I've, you know, I've shared a little bit of this information in the past, but this time I pulled some more stuff together just to give you an idea, an example of what's available. Um, there's just, like I said, I, I came home, I was out there one time for a week and came home with 2000 copies, photocopies. Oh, wow. We've been out there more than once. And uh, I've had a, access to a photocopy that would let me scan and save as pdfs and jpegs so i've scanned almost all of what i've copied is now on my computer plus i've scanned that msnl 1928 summary report um, which someone fortunately came across and was able to came across an original and was able to get copies made um, for some of us at that time um, so yeah, this inf this type of information's out there. It's difficult to come across once in a while, but if if you're interested, in, as as Chuck has demonstrated, he's built some very fine models of M and St. L structures and went from Winthrop, Minnesota, based on this information. So yeah, so good stuff. Well, I'm glad you appreciated it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. That's great. Uh, really interesting. And you say some of that is available online now at that at that uh, archives address that you posted there. I only what it'll do is just get, kind of give you kind of an inventory of what they have. Okay. They, to my knowledge, they have never posted any of the actual field notes or re, or summary reports. Okay. So, but again, it's been a, it's been a while since I've done any work with the ICC reports. It, they might have started doing that with more current technology i know that they now will let you take in your laptop and your scanner instead of using their photocopier mm -hmm. so you can scan directly um, when we were there we had to wear the white gloves we had to be very careful we had to go up to the desk to ask if we could take the cover off the booklet so we could pull the pages out to make photocopies mm -hmm. and i remember one time we were there was when they had released the latest information on the kennedy shooting in dallas and there was a couple of the, you know, conspirators there with all these college students hired, and they were just pouring through box after box after box of that Kennedy stuff. We had to wait in line to use the photocopier that of those oh days. It was, yeah. and there was an overhead balcony, and you could see the, the some of the archivists up in the balcony looking down to make sure that we weren't stuffing stuff in our pants or our bags <laughs> because we, you know you were only allowed to take in a, a note paper and a pencil. You couldn't take anything else in at that time, and it was just, yeah, they were really watching the kid. That they could care less about my wife and I what we were doing, but they were watching that Kennedy stuff like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was the ICC valuation of the Grassy Knoll? 
<laughs> you know, I, I never called up the Texas box, so I can't say. <laughs> yeah. The book depository the, <laughs> and whatever yeah. it was. But we were totally surprised at some of the things we came across, like the light fixtures inside the depots and the, and the counters, those drawings of this. You know, my wife would say, look at this. I go, go make a photocopy. Photocopies were 15 cents a piece. They, they, you could go down to the treasurer's office, put a, use your credit card to put $20 on the card to use in the photocopier. When it went empty, you went back with your credit card again. And I said, I don't care how much we spend. This is our only chance to get copies of this type, this stuff. So we're going to do it. And um, haven't regretted spending that money at all that week. So. I thought it was interesting. I've never heard of uh, of a railroad owning a grain elevator. Where, what town was that in? What road was that on? That was Rock Island, Neola, Iowa. How okay. common was that? What was that? How common was that? Very rare in my experience. It's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, okay. There's another one. The one in Tama was owned by the railroad and leased to Beal. Hmm. And I okay. have all of that. That's what I built. The I'll send you some pictures tomorrow of the uh, the elevator I built from the ICC uh, paper. Yeah. Usually the railroad owned the land, and it was leased to the elevator company who built their own building. But occasionally the railroads built buildings, and they leased. I think especially early on, just to generate customers and and revenue they would go ahead and put the building up and then lease it out to an operator so but uh so that's that's what i've got to share with you i appreciate it doug that was really great thanks for doing <laughs> that um trying to see here let's see next week i think uh lester i've got you on for next week right yes yes okay and uh so lester's gonna be talking about tools for bills, building plastic and resin freight cars. I believe I've been told I gave that presentation and I'll show next week in St. Louis in 2018 or 19. Okay. Very good. So we'll look forward to that. And uh, thanks everybody for coming tonight. One, one thing, Greg. Yeah. Uh, for people being, he's just mentioned St. Louis. I understand there is a big baseball game the weekend of RPM. Mm. And they say it's hard to get a hotel within 50 miles due to that game. So if you haven't scheduled your hotel yet for Collinsville, you may want to do that right away. Oh, okay. <laughs> good info. Word to the wise. Yes. Yep. Thank you much. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody wants any, you know, some specifics with the ICC reports I have, drop me an email and I'll, I can send what I can come find. So that's great. Yep. Well, thanks, Doug. Thanks, everybody. Yep. And uh, we will see you again next week at uh, 630 uh, for Lester's presentation. Have a great weekend. Right. Thank you. Have a great time. Thank you. Yeah.